She's a secretary and I work with her at the African Energy and Mining Management Initiative, an NGO based in Uganda. She's our secretary and also administrator. So she's based in Uganda and as a startup we have our small office in Nafete. And I see on your card uh, there's something about an extractive hub. Uh, what is that about? Uh, the extractive hub is the project I'm currently working on as a research fellow. It's sponsored by the UK government and it's based at the University of Dundee at the Centre for Energy, Petroleum and Mineral and Policy. So basically what we do at the extractive hub is we do provide technical assistance to developing countries, but we focus on oil, gas, and mining projects. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I want you to proceed then and make your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. So my presentation today is focusing on the nexus between land access, energy, and mining uh, in Uganda, though I, I always prefer to widen my, my scope. So, in summary, I'll first uh, highlight something brief about land access, but I should note that since my, my, my project, my presentation is focused on energy and mining, I'll make it clear, so I'll not go into other issues that are outside energy and mining issues with respect to land access. So I'll highlight a brief about uh, land access issues, and then a brief about uh, the nexus between land access and the mining sector, and also, I will briefly talk about the nexus between land access and the energy sector. And then afterwards, given the global move and global attention given to climate change, I will briefly highlight uh, the nexus between land access, extractive, and also climate change. So that will be a trilemma between land access, uh, extractive industries, and climate change. And then I will pose a few questions of what we can consider besides the national land matters. Can we talk about regional land access? Does it affect the energy sector? Does it affect the mining sector? So I'll just pose a few questions with respect to that. Uh, so a brief about land access. Uh, basically, we're aware that under Article 273 of the, of the Ugandan Constitution, it says that land belongs to the people. But the issue of focus for me right here is Article 26 and Section 3 of the Land Act that focus on compensation. Like uh, a person has to be compensated for their land if it's to be taken from them. And now I also have to note something that is really important for my presentation and it's the fact that over 80% of people in rural areas in Uganda but also in other developing countries do depend on their land for livelihood and survival. I will explore more on that when I start talking about the mining sector. But uh, like that's like something we really need to know. And then with respect, uh, we, we, we all know that there are different land tenure systems in Uganda. But my interest here will be on the customary land tenure system, specifically how it's likely to affect issues of, of mining, especially small scale and at sun mining. So I will still tackle that when I'm talking about the mining issues. And obviously I've already mentioned the issue of compensation, which is very key in Uganda and obviously other African countries. And another thing that is really important is the issue to do with environmental issues associated with extractives. By extractives, I refer to oil, gas, and mining. Though we know that the energy sector is really wide, it includes renewables. But the focus here will be on oil, gas, and coal, but we don't have coal, we don't really have coal in Uganda, so it will be oil and gas. And then also on the issue of land access and mining, we have to be aware of the regional issues that come with land access or energy energy projects. So that's something still I will highlight in my presentation. So I'll go straight on the issue of energy. So basically the energy sector is a white sector. It involves oil, gas, renewables such as solar, biomass, biogas, wind, hydropower, just to mention but a few. And the African continent is a home of uh, massive energy resources. For instance, in Uganda, we, we, we are aware we have 6.5 
6.5 billion barrels of oil, but we also have other renewable sources, including solar, wind energy, hydropower, and uh, bioenergy, and, and many others. So the issue here, when we, when we talk about energy access and land, when we are to bring in the connectivity or the nexus, we have to be aware of one thing, that energy is very key in our economic development. Obviously, we are using electricity right now, and we also take into consideration that goal saving of the UN Sustainable Development Goals relates to access to modern energy. So it becomes important to understand the difference between modern energy and traditional energy. Modern energy is the electricity we have, uh, natural gas, which people use for cooking, and then traditional energy, as we are aware in our different um, rural areas, the size of firewood, for cooking, candles, for lighting, and many others. And we, another important thing to note here is uh, traditional energy basically has various negative impacts, not only to the environment, but also to the health of the people. I'll give an example, like in Southern Africa, uh, in Sadaf, it's estimated that over one, uh, 150,000 people die every year due to indoor uh, burning of biomass. And obviously, this is also common in Uganda because we know that people in rural areas, they basically rely on firewood, they rely on charcoal. So it has various health and environmental impacts. Uh, also, just to highlight the, how the issue of energy, why it's really important, I know that uh, if, you, if you have to look at the UN Sustainable Goals, there's no way we can achieve all the goals relating to poverty eradication, that's goal one, uh, relating to gender equality, uh, and all relating to health, if we cannot uh, first address the issue of ac having access to modern energy. And that's, uh, that's just so one part, because Energy, if we talk about eradication of poverty, how can we eradicate poverty if most people have no access to modern energy? And you also have to note issues of accessibility, reliability, and also affordability. So even if you have energy, is it affordable? Can people afford that energy? Is it reliable? Is it sustainable? So those are some of the issues we really have to note. So when you talk about uh, the issue of gender equality, how does it relate to energy? You know that women are the major users of energy, mostly in rural areas. Uh, last week I was in Ethiopia and we had a trip and we saw many women carrying firewood on their back and they said it's mostly women who do that kind of job. Obviously this is also common in Uganda we know women and children, they spend most of their time collecting firewood, cooking. So that highlights how energy is really important. Now, going back to the basic presentation, the focus of this presentation, the nexus between energy and land access. Energy projects cannot succeed without access to land because they need vast areas of land to be successful. We've seen issues where local communities have to be dislocated. They have, in most cases, they're displaced. So energy projects, they have um, they highlight social, environmental, and economic issues. Socially, we are seeing issues of dislocation of people. Environmentally, when we're talking about oil and gas, we've seen issues of oil spills, gas flaring. It's not just here in Uganda, but we're starting, uh, uh, we're, we're focusing here. We're starting uh, our oil project, so so on, we'll be experiencing such, such issues. How do they relate to land? When oil is spilled, the land, agricultural land, that is relied on by most people, it will be affected. The fishing industry, because I mentioned 85% of people in rural areas rely on land for their livelihood. And, in, uh, and most energy resources are located in rural areas. So these people are likely to be affected. Now the issue of compensation, because it will be like, yes, these people are always compensated for their land. In most cases, the compensation is not adequate because we don't take into consideration the environmental issues associated with energy projects. So we might consider compensation based on maybe the, how people are compensated in urban areas, but we forget the mere fact that these people in rural areas, they mostly rely on their land for farming, agriculture, and also fishing. 
So the issue of compensation has to be looked into when we are compensating such people located in rural areas. And also another issue when we are talking about uh, just a graph, just to show that even people who have access to energy, those who can afford, there are some people who can't afford modern energy, they can't afford to pay for electricity. So it's understandable they will not, they will have no access. But then there's questions where even people who have access, I mean who can afford to pay for that energy, they still have no access and that's basically due to accessibility issues, lack of infrastructure. So that's also something that to take into consideration. That access and energy, I've already mentioned most of the things, issues, social issues to do with relocation of people, displacements, land grabbing, compensation is never adequate. And then I've already also talked about the impact of fossil fuels on the land, those are the environmental issues, because it's all related on the land. How will it, how will it, how will it be affected afterwards? So we need to take that into consideration. And now I, I, I would like to pose a question, like if any of this, uh, the, com the Commission of Inquiry is focused on Uganda, what about issues that are outside of Uganda? What about regional issues? Are they important in our hearing? Are they important in our everyday life? And the answer to that is yes, they are important because uh, of one major fact, we notice that energy projects, especially energy infrastructure, they go beyond the national boundaries. You look at the oil and gas pipeline that is being um, planned in Uganda, it will go through Uganda, uh, Tanzania. You look at electric transmission lines. So are our laws adequate enough to take into regional issues? And yeah, that's the question I would guess, like to pose. And also I'd like to focus on, on the fact that we are moving towards regionalism as African countries and other countries. So we should also be aware of such issues, regional issues, when you are talking about energy access and, 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 and land. Then that's just an example of some of the regional energy infrastructure in West Africa. They have the West African gas pipeline. But obviously the East African community also is planning to, uh, to construct same region energy infrastructure. So we have to be aware that this energy infrastructure will definitely have an impact on land and also on the local communities that are likely to be affected by this project. Then I'll go to the mining sector briefly. Um, Africa is a home to 30% of the global mineral resources and Uganda is also very rich in mining in minerals including gold, copper, tin, sand and also stone precious stone. And on the issue of land, we have to be, uh, on the issue of mining and land access, we have to be aware of the two different types of mining, that is large-scale mining and small-scale mining. Large-scale mining, we all know it involves foreign companies, and then small and atom mining, it involves the local people. My focus here will be on small-scale mining. On large-scale mining, it's based by the issue of compensation. Are the people compensated where those companies are operating from. Is this adequate compensation? What about what happens after the, the minerals have been exhausted? Do they take into consideration mine closures? Can the people utilize their land after these minerals have been exploited? So that's something we need to consider when we're talking about large-scale mining. Then as uh, small-scale mining, as sun mining, it's a big issue. In Uganda, but also in other African countries, I was recently in Ghana, and when you're talking about mining in Ghana, their main focus will be at sun mining. They call it gilemeter mining. So that's also an issue. How does it relate to the um, land rights? We notice that most people who are involved in informal mining, that is most hill and at sun mining, they're mostly located in rural areas. They do have customary land tenure, and uh, the customs in those areas will, um, they will, the customs in those areas will be followed with respect to land rights and also uh, with respect to mining. So in most cases, we notice that not only in Uganda but also in other countries, if we're trying to formalize the small-scale mining sector, 
But we notice that if the customary land tenures are not formalized, if people have no certificates of ownership, then it will be hard for us to formalize the uh, Atsuna mining sector. And I have to note, because I've done videos, good work videos in this respect, we've uh, interviewed Moscow miners, I've interviewed miners involved in gold mining, salt mining, also sand mining. Most of them work in dangerous uh, environments. Uh, the activities have a negative impact on their health, on the environment, and it's all due to the informality involved in this sector. And it's also due to the fact that we fail to understand that the land tenure systems in, in those areas do greatly influence the way these people work. So the key concerns with respect to my presentation, first we have to be aware of the need for Uganda to take the issues of social license to operate seriously. Social license to operate basically means that the mining or energy project works closely with the community and in that in that respect